Happy birthday, Grandma, we yelled. Before we celebrated with a triple-tiered cake and homemade strawberry banana ice cream, one by one, her friends and family walked to her and presented their gifts. Dad gave her a diamond tennis bracelet. Grandma said thank you, and a maid took it away. Mom gave Grandma an antique 1922 first edition of Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem, Grandma's favorite book. Grandma said thank you, and a maid took it away. My older brother, sister-in-law, and niece gave Grandma a family gift of diamond earrings set in rose gold. Grandma said thank you, and a maid took it away. One friend, Madeline, gave a designer shawl. Another friend, Grace, adjusted one of her hearing aids and then gave Grandma a homemade coupon promising to buy her lunch at Brancusi's Fine Italian. Another friend, Anthony, Grace's husband, gave her a book. Grandma said thank you to all of them and a maid placed them with the others in the pile on the table. Grandma is one of the richest people in Nevada. She won't confirm it, but I suspect she's worth nine figures. I was the last to present my gift and I held the small rectangular package wrapped in colorful tissue. My gift was the cheapest. A little book of poems I'd handwritten and handbound with little illustrations I'd drawn. The glue on the binding had only felt dry yesterday. I'd made six copies, one for me, one for my creative writing teacher, one for grandma, with three left over. Someday I would get my poems published for real. Grandma thumbed through it, pausing to read one. You wrote these, she asked. I nodded. I bound it with real leather, too. Writing is my dream. Happy birthday. My brother loudly whispered, How cheap is my brother? My mother said, I've never been so embarrassed. My son even looks like an old ratty college student. I thought gay guys were supposed to have style, my sister-in-law sneered. I didn't say anything, because she was right. I can't afford style. When the maid came to take my gift, Grandma shooed her away and held on to my little handmade book. Before I left the party, I packed my nice clothes into my backpack and changed into knee-length khaki shorts and a t-shirt. My old green 10-speed I'd bought from a thrift store was parked outside the front door, and I rode it past my parents' black. BMW Series 8 Special Edition, my brother's silver Mercedes-Benz S580, and my sister-in-law's pink Tesla Model X P100D, all made this year. Grandma has a huge garage in back, with room for a dozen cars, and my family lives with her, so why do they show off their cars like this? I'm the rebel in the family. I don't live with Grandma. I'm Lewis Claymore, age 22, about to graduate college with a Bachelor of English with a focus on creative literature. Poetry is my thing, as is experimental fantasy novels. I'm never going to get rich, am I? My brother got a high-priced degree in finance from some elite college, but he never uses it. He likes the life that Grandma pays for. If you've heard the Claymore name, it's because Grandma is the owner and lead shareholder for the Claymore Cosmetics Consortium. Yes, she's loaded, and then some. Grandma would have paid for my college at some exclusive school, just like my brother's. She did pay for my private high school. Her money bought my former clothes. My dream is different than my family's. I want something different than a life getting pampered. I don't live in Grandma's house. House isn't the right word. I don't know if anyone has ever counted how many rooms that monster has. It's so big, it covers two time zones. My former boyfriend would have snickered at that joke. Get it? It's so big. (laughs) My family's money came with an annoying price tag. Mom and Dad had planned out my entire life and wanted to control everything. I said, no thanks. That's not my dream, and walked away. They screamed, you'll be a failure without us. Then it will be my failure, I said, and that is something I can be proud of. They didn't like it when I found my own job. They didn't like it when I stopped depending on their money. 
They didn't like it when I re-enrolled in a more practical college so I could afford my own tuition. They didn't like it when I learned how to cook and clean and do laundry. They didn't like it when I got a cheap apartment. My old boyfriend moved out because he said, I'm too stingy. I'm looking for a roommate. Anyone interested? My family didn't like me buying used clothes and used furniture and a used bike. They didn't like me using public transportation either. After all, they can buy me any car they want. I only had to follow their every whim, command, demand, and order. Just like my brother. When they asked, I responded, No thanks, I'm leaving to find my own dream. They didn't like not being able to control me. Today was Sunday. I can't wait to get back to my apartment and the real world. Who knew that I'd enjoy laundry? Monday was a long day at work, and that was only the pre-lunch rush. My last customer before my lunch break returned a brand new, latest edition Android phone with all the bells and whistles, because it had a scuff on the screen. It looked more like a fingerprint, but the customer is always right. Company policy is no returns without a receipt. She produced a receipt. Company policy said that the receipt must be dated within 90 days of purchase. Hers was 107 days. Her constant yelling gave me a headache and my patience was now non-existent. It was hard not to yell back. She made a stink clear up to corporate. In the process, some corporate guru approved a return. My extra strength headache pounded my skull and I'd missed lunch. Boss told me to take a late lunch to calm down. Why am I working full-time at Verity Phones? Because I need to earn my own money so my parents can't control me. I want to make it on my own. Because I see how my brother and sister-in-law and my nephews kowtow to my grandma and parents and get everything handed to them. I don't like how spoiled they seem. My sister-in-law has to call a servant to replace a light bulb and my brother can't pump gas into the overpriced car my parents bought him. It's a major disaster if anyone in my family got their hands dirty. My family would be ashamed of me if they knew I cleaned my own toilet. In my completely biased opinion, my parents and siblings are leeching off Grandma Ernesta Claymore's hard work. She was the brainchild that set up Claymore Cosmetics back in the 1970s and later bought out two other companies to make it the consortium. Grandma is all business. And if she even had a soul, only Grandpa had the patience to find it. When Grandpa died, I was ten. She mourned by buying another company. Rest in peace, Grandpa. Verity Phones is located on the second level of the Hanson Mall, a split-level outdoor concourse housing nearly a hundred shops, lots of restaurants, knick-knack stores, a couple of bookstores, a bakery, three other phone stores, and us. Technically, my older brother and his wife are my parents' official heirs, and my parents are grandma's heirs. Since I've rejected their lifestyle, I will become a footnote in their will, stating not to give me anything. That's fine with me. For my late lunch, I've stopped by Peking Budget Gourmet and picked up an order of Kung Pao chicken with two Mapo tofu egg rolls. I don't know what a Mapo is, but it's good. The food court is nearby with their hundreds of seats. It's just after the lunch rush, so every table is full, but not every seat. I scanned the seats and finally found one. It's a table for four, but only one guy is sitting there, a guy I've seen around. I think he is a chef at Gerard's Fine Cuisine because he is still wearing the apron. Shoulder length, dark brown hair with long bangs that seem to hide his eyes. Skin tanned by living in the sun, a narrow, sensitive face he was reading a graphic novel and had a worn skateboard next to him. As I approached the table, he lifted the book a little to turn a page, and I saw the title, ElfQuest Volume 3. You're kidding. Wasn't that the series by Wendy Peeney? She'd been creating it for the last 40 years. I own Volume 1 and 2, plus a couple of the original black and white comics from way back when. Hey, I said, can I join you? I'm into ElfQuest too. The man didn't look up. Of course he didn't realize I was talking to him. Through the hair, something glimmered around his ears. It was so noisy in here, 
and he was obviously wearing earbuds. I tapped at the table. He looked up. I pointed at me, then at the table, and then at my food. He gave a delightful smile and gestured for me to join him. His hand quickly pointed at me with two fingers, then it twisted a little, tucking the two fingers in and raising the pinky. Odd, but whatever. Quickly I took a seat and said, I have volume one and two, but I haven't read volume three yet. Is it good? For a second he frowned, then quickly typed a text, but rather than send it, he showed me his phone number. That made sense. It was too loud in here to talk otherwise. I took out my phone, typed a text to his number that said, Hi, I'm Lewis Claymore, and I like ElfQuest too. I sent it to his number. His phone vibrated, and he texted back, Kel Draper. It's short for Kellak. My mom is Hindi. I'm named after my great uncle. Nice, I texted. How much ElfQuest have you read? Volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4 several times. Ordering volume 5 next paycheck. You? Volume 1 and 2 only. But I have a couple of the old comics and one is even signed. We texted for the next 15 minutes, texting about ElfQuest, about our jobs, about school. Kel was working on an art degree because he wanted to make comics. Kel was definitely a speed texter. It seemed like he only teased the screen and a novel appeared. Wow. It felt like I had barely sat down when Kel's phone vibrated. He shyly looked at me, trying not to smile, and quickly texted, Lunch break is over. Meet you tomorrow? Text me, I said. I didn't know it then, but my world had changed. When I got home that night, I wrote a poem about the dark-haired stranger I'd had lunch with. As I tucked the finished poem into my notebook, my brother texted me, Can I borrow a thousand dollars? Grandma's allowance ran out. What would I do if I had an extra thousand dollars? Buy a new bike, because the handlebars on this one wobbled. I texted back, sorry, spent it on rent. His response, loser. The next day, I received a text from Kel. Still on for lunch? Same elf time, same elf place, I texted back. Boss actually preferred me taking a later lunch, because we usually had a lot of people visit us on their lunch hour. Stopping by Peking Budget Gourmet, I picked up an orange chicken with two Szechuan spicy egg rolls and a green tea to go. I texted Kel, where are you? Table near the stairs. I found him at the table, the third ElfQuest volume by his side with a bookmark holding his place, and his skateboard on the floor next to him. He had a plate full of a chicken stir-fry with rice noodles and a cappuccino rested nearby. He smiled as he saw me and waved. His face filled with joy. God, I loved watching him. His eyes glimmered and, as he smiled, he slightly bit his lower lip. Once again, he made the hand gesture where he pointed two fingers at me, tucked them in, slightly twisted his hand so the little finger pointed up. He made some other gestures that made little sense to me. I'm glad to see you, I said, setting my food on the table and then taking a seat. A slight worry creased his forehead. It was as loud in here today as it was yesterday, so I got my phone out and sent him a picture. My ElfQuest collection. We began texting, just like we had yesterday, and he texted me about his work. His phone never buzzed or rang. It only vibrated and lit up. We were in the middle of a conversation about our different majors when he suddenly smiled and ran his hands through his shoulder-length dark hair. I don't think he meant to, but it momentarily showed his ears, though both were double-pierced with silver studs. That wasn't what caught my attention. The hearing aids he wore did. He let his hair fall, once again hiding his ears. I stood up, walked over to him, and gently lifted the hair away so I could look. The hearing aid was an odd-shaped unit that molded around his ear with a small earpiece that went into the ear canal. Lewis, I told myself, sometimes you're really dense. His hand gestures must have been ASL, sign language. I resumed my seat, but the joy had vanished from Kel's face. His lip trembled, and an odd terror flashed across his eyes. I texted, why didn't you tell me? His text? A simple question mark. My mind filled in the answers. Was he ashamed of his condition? Maybe he was lonely and thought his new friend, me, 
would abandon him. Had this been a deal breaker for a past relationship? Was he expecting this to be a deal breaker now? Was it? There had been a deaf unit at my high school, but I'd never interacted with them. Too busy with my own life, I guess. And I didn't know sign language. I shifted seats to the one next to him and texted. I'll let you try the orange chicken if I can have a bite of the noodle thing. We quickly exchanged food and then I texted, what happened? And tapped my ear. His fingers flew over his phone and a second later, a new novel appeared. My hearing started to go when I was 10 and was nearly gone when I was 16. They diagnosed me with severe auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. And for some reason, the signals from my ears don't make it to my brain. They've tried nerve stimulation and a bunch of other stuff, but nothing seems to work. The hearing aids help me with loud noises. What about cochlear implants? I texted. It's not the eardrum that's the issue, he texted. You good at lip reading? I texted. No, but I'm pro at texting. And he hesitantly smiled. I smiled. He eyed me carefully, like a deer not sure whether to run or not. The next move was up to me. I faced him and tried to duplicate the hand gesture he used to greet me. We both smiled at my lousy attempt, and he gently took my hand and helped me form the sign. It's finger spilling, he texted. H and I. Hi. His face filled with joy again. I don't think Kel realized he was still holding my hand. I didn't mind. I practiced the sign a couple of times, with Kel adjusting my fingers. His phone vibrated. His next text? Lunch is over. I texted back. Same elf time tomorrow? My reward was the biggest smile I'd ever seen, and a quick nod. About seven, when I'd gotten back to my cheap apartment with its cheap couch and cheap table and cheap chairs and a cheap bed. God, I love this place. Kel texted me. I finished volume three. Do you want to borrow it? I texted back. Only if I can buy you dinner Saturday night. Later we can stop by the comic store before they close. Maybe they have some old issues. Are you asking me out on a date? Why? He texted. I wasn't sure if he was being self-conscious or if he had a bad experience dating. Maybe a little bit of flirt would go a long way. My next text was definitely a bit flirty. Reasons to date Kel. 1. You're cute. 2. We like the same things. 3. We work close to each other. 4. You have pretty eyes. 5. You listen, even if it is by text. 6. You have the cutest nose. 7. You're creative. 8. Love the apron. Someday you'll have to cook something for me. 9. Love the hair. 10. I like you. P.S. If dating me bothers you, don't think of it as a date. Think of it as two new friends hanging out. A minute passed, and then the text said, Saturday, 6 okay? I live with my parents. Dad is a little weird about me going out. I texted, I'll make sure I shower, wear deodorant, and cover up the tattoo. Tattoo? He texted. I have a shark on my shoulder, because I was on the swim team in high school, I texted. Love to see it. Cal also texted his address. It was only a few miles from here, and better yet, it was on the bus route. That night, I wrote a ten-line poem about the cute guy that likes elves. My brother also texted. I really need the money. Are you sure you don't have any? I texted back. Sell your car. No, he texted. Why? I texted. None of your business, he texted. Kel and I still had lunch together for the rest of the week and I still had my afternoon classes. Every night, I wrote a poem about him. Was I falling for him? For his cute smile, the cute shy way he helped me with some signs. He wore his joy like a blanket and let me snuggle into it. I liked him. A lot. When Saturday came, I ordered an Uber. I wasn't going to take a bus to go on a date, even if we weren't going anyplace super fancy. I was thinking Gordon's Gourmet Burgers, home of the nuclear cholesterol bomb. What do they say about best laid plans? The Uber pulled up in front of a row of yellow brick townhouses that had been new 40 years ago. His was the fourth one in. The air smelled of fried potatoes, fried tomatoes, and barbecued chicken. 
Some kind of spice flavored the air, but I didn't recognize it. His unit had a toy fire engine in the yard, a plastic kiddie pool half full of water, the what remains of some kind of slip and slide on the sidewalk, three adult-sized plastic chairs, two cars parked out front, a barbecue grill on the front porch currently cooking something, with a brown-haired Caucasian middle-aged man watching over it. The Uber let me off, and I told them to wait. I walked up to the open front door. Sounds of kids playing video games and the smells of something good simmering on the stove greeted me. The man at the barbecue eyed me, not exactly smiling, and signed well he said, You must be Lewis, Kel's date. Hope you're hungry because my wife has made enough food to feed an army. Knowing her, you'll leave with enough food for three meals. Um, I don't understand, I said. We were going to Gordon's. The screen door opened and a dark-skinned woman with long straight hair walked out. I assumed this was Kel's mom because they looked alike, but Kel had his father's jaw. So you are Lewis Claymore, she said, also signing as she spoke. Kel has told us everything about you. That's my husband, Colin, and I'm Bakhti, Kel's mother. Welcome to our home. Colin grunted. You can tell the Uber to leave. My wife has already made dinner. I began to get anxious but I did my best not to let it show. Kel rushed outside, his eyes wide with panic and fear, and he signed so fast that his hands were a blur. I must have looked really confused, because Bhakti translated, I'm sorry, Louis. I didn't know my parents would do this. I tried to tell them to stay out of my life, but they wouldn't listen. Sometimes it feels like they won't let me grow up. Please, stay. His dad signed and said, It's our job to worry about you and keep you safe. Bhakti signed and said, We only want to make sure we can trust Lewis. Besides, he doesn't even sign. I am deaf, Mom, not stupid. We text, Kel signed, and Bhakti translated. We'll talk about this over dinner, Colin ordered, signing as well. Take your guest inside and make him feel welcome. I did not feel welcome. Kel took me inside where the air smelled of unfamiliar spices and fried food. Pulling his phone out, he texted, Sorry about this. I had no idea that they were doing this until a few minutes ago. I'm saving up money to get my own place, but I'm not ready yet. Every time I talk to them about getting my own apartment, they freak out. Why are they so overprotective? I texted. They still treat me as the kid slowly losing his hearing. They don't understand that that was years ago. My parents drive me crazy, he texted. Colin and Bhakti's attitude made a frustrating sort of sense. They had been caring for a hearing disabled child for a little more than a decade, and now that he had grown up, they had a hard time dealing with his growing independence. In a way, his parents sounded like my parents. Except in Kel's family, there had once been a medical need. While they finished getting dinner ready, Kel introduced me to his three brothers, ages 19, 17, and 8, and their sister, age 13. Kel was the oldest of the five, being 21, and the only one with hearing issues. They lived in a three-bedroom townhouse, two bedrooms upstairs with the master bedroom downstairs. The bedroom downstairs was for the parents. Upstairs, one room was for the daughter, and the last room had two sets of bunk beds for Kel and his brothers. Kel showed me his collection and apologized almost every minute for his parents. The one thing about Kel, he'd be lousy at poker. His face mirrored his emotions. I think what he wanted to say to me was, will you still be my friend? Dinner was good. Chicken masala, yellow rice, some kind of fried green beans with a crunchy spicy coating, and for dessert, Indian milk balls, which are small dough balls deep fried like donuts and dipped into a sweet syrup. But rather than use the traditional sugar, they used honey as a sweetener. We spoke about college, about my job at Verity Phones, about their family life, and most kids signed and spoke. And when needed, Kel's mom or dad translated for me. It was a good conversation until the 17-year-old brother, Avi, the only person who didn't sign as he spoke, asked, since you're dating my brother, what kind of car are you going to buy me? Make it a Corvette. I don't own a car, I said. Colin gave Avi a stern look and said, please treat our guest with a little courtesy. Once Bakhti had translated, Kel signed, He takes the bus, same as me. 
That's stupid. Lewis is loaded, Avi said, but didn't sign. No, I'm not, I said. I looked you up and guess what I found, Avi boasted. He held up his phone to show the family photo from the Claymore Cosmetic Consortium website. And there I was, near the end. Admittedly, the photo was three years old and taken the Christmas after high school. Dad had made sure we were all in black ties. I even had to borrow one of his old suits and ties. Kel signed something and his mom translated. You're rich? The least you can do is gift me a car, Avi said. And I want a dollhouse, the little sister said. I smiled and said, no, I'm not rich. I gave all that up. Either you are lying or you are sick in the head, Avi shouted. I want my car. Sit down, Avi, Colin said. I think now is the time for you to tell a story, Lewis. I took another milk ball, dipped it into the honey sauce, and took a small bite before I said, I was always uncomfortable with that life. Being rich has its stresses. I always had to do what they wanted, had to act a certain way, be their trophy son. Back in high school, I spent some time with one of the counselors because I was depressed. My parents wanted one thing, I wanted something different. My family lives off Grandma Ernesta's money, but over the months I worked with the counselor, my attitude slowly changed. She said something that made me rethink my whole life. What did she say? Bhakti asked. The price of independence is opening your eyes, I said, and deciding who is going to control your dreams. Them or you. That's stupid, Avi said. I take the money every time. I thought a moment and finally said, but at what cost? I wanted to be a different person than what they wanted me to be. They can keep their fancy houses and expensive clothes and keep their customized cars, but my dreams are mine. Do you still see your family? Bhakti asked. On special occasions. But like Avi, they think I'm stupid for rejecting the good life, I said. And? Bhakti asked. We don't relate anymore, I said. Kel signed something, and his mother shook her head and signed something back. She made a nodding fist motion to his dad. Colin nodded and looked at me. Louis, I relate. Everybody has issues with their parents, even us, but that's another story. If you want to date our son, we will require two things. Kel signed something. His mom answered, this is for your own good. This is the most complicated first date I have ever had. I asked, what do you mean? It's obvious, Kel's dad said. You don't sign. We text, I said. Kel's jaw dropped and his eyes narrowed. He signed something. His mother slammed her fingers together in a gesture I would later learn meant no, and she said and signed to her son, then he's not the right one. Lewis, texting is not good enough, his dad said. You'll need to learn sign language. I already figured that out. And the second request, I asked. Because of his deafness, my son is very naive about the world. We will be the ones who will approve of whoever he chooses to date, Colin said. And if we don't approve, then he chooses someone else. I shrugged, getting annoyed, and said, Cal's 21. You treat your son as if he's helpless, maybe even stupid, as if he were still a little kid. You do realize that because of his phone, he probably knows more about what's going on in the world than you do, and he is very social. I bet he texts dozens of friends daily. He's deaf, but because of his phone, he's not isolated. While you were too busy worrying about his condition, he grew up, started dating, and got a job as a chef. I wouldn't be surprised if he became head chef someday. While I spoke, his mom had been translating. Kel got out of his seat, stood behind me, and for the first time ever, I heard his voice as he vocalized and signed. I'm not a little kid, Dad. I'm 21. Stop being mean to my dates, otherwise I won't bring home the leftover desserts anymore. His mom gave a soft chuckle and said, That's a serious threat. Dad, like it or not, Kel is of age and you can't baby him forever. I keep telling you it's time to cut the apron strings and let Kel fly. Besides, if I don't get any more of the lemon blueberry bars because of you, I will never forgive you. Kel's dad's face reddened. The silverware clattered as his brothers ate. One thing about us guys, we could eat through the apocalypse. I'll make sure Kel is okay, I said, 
and Bhakti translated. I'll make sure Louis is okay, Kel vocalized. Bhakti gave her husband a stern look and said, Lemon blueberry bars, dear. His dad leaned back in his chair and said, Everybody is ganging up on me. I surrender. I guess I have to approve if I still want specialty desserts, but I'm not backing down on learning sign language. Sunday, the next day, I searched beginning ASL night classes and found a 12-week series at the Gregson Institute for the Hearing Impaired, taught Tuesdays and Thursdays. I must be crazy, but Kel is pretty special. I hate to admit it. His overprotective dad is right about this. Tuesday, about 10 days later, first night of class, Kel rearranged his work schedule to come with me. He'd been to the Institute many times as a boy. They'd helped him adjust to losing his hearing and how to function in society. The class had a dozen people already in it when Kel and I showed up. Kel had to stop and chat with a couple of people he knew. I got many subtle looks. What had Kel said about me? Finally, the teacher showed up. A woman nearing 70 and wearing a stylish blue and white blouse and white slacks. I knew her. Her pure white hair almost hid the earpieces she wore. As she entered, she saw Kel and her face broke into smiles. Kel, it's been years, she said, signing simultaneously. It was Grace, Grandma Ernesta's friend. Kel ran up to her and they hugged. He made a sign using the two main fingers of each hand and tapped them together. You have a boyfriend? Here in my class, she said, signing also. Introduce us at once. Kel was telling everybody here that I was his boyfriend? We hadn't even kissed. Why did something inside me want to giggle? In a second, Kel brought Grace over to me and pulled out his phone and texted. This is my friend from when I first started going deaf. Her name is Grace, and she taught me to sign and helped me learn to accept deafness. Grace's eyes widened a little as she saw me, and her eyebrows shot up. Small world. You know Kel? I did the little hand gesture I'd learned from Kel that meant hi, then pointed at myself and awkwardly fingerspelled L-O-U-I-S. C-L-A-M-O-R-E Louis Claymore Kel signed and Grace translated Louis is my boyfriend and Dad wants him to learn how to sign What are you doing here, Grace? You're deaf? I asked Grace paused as if looking into her memory and softly said I met your grandparents nearly 25 years ago when Ernesta brought your grandfather in You probably didn't know this but when your grandfather was younger he worked at an airport the loud noises affected his hearing, and it got worse as he aged. We helped them out. Grandpa was deaf, I asked. Not as bad as your boyfriend, she said. My phone buzzed with an incoming text from Kel. Grace has been here forever and taught me how to be a person again. Kel, she said, signing. Louis is not going to learn if you don't put that damn phone away. Don't worry, Louis. Give me a few months and we'll have you up to speed. What am I getting myself into? By this time, I had written a dozen poems about this man. My feelings were deep. I couldn't deny it any longer. I was falling in love. I went to almost every class session, and Kel joined me several times. His parents invited me for dinner every Saturday night, and then Kel and I would find a movie somewhere or go bowling. I had just gotten home after a date, and my brother texted me again. I need that money now. I don't have it, I said. Go ask Grandma. I can't, he texted. Grandma learned I had been gambling and was in debt, and she refused to pay it. She cut my allowance in half. You have to help me. Same advice as before, I texted. Sell your car, your jewelry, and find a job. Time to stand on your own two feet. Make your wife proud. His final text? F you. One Friday night, about a month after Kel and I started seriously dating, I walked him up to the townhouse, and we sat outside. I gently kissed him, watching the wonder fill his eyes. I texted because my sign language wasn't very good. I want to give you something that's very important to me. Kel's smile brightened my night. He texted, a present for me? Hold out your hands and close your eyes, I texted. He did. 
I pulled the small, wrapped package from my pocket and placed it in his hands. He opened his eyes. A rectangular package. It was something that I spent hours making. He opened it, seeing the handwritten book of poems and the little drawings I had made. He read through a couple, flipped through the pages, and focused on the title page. Poems and Illustration by Lewis Claymore. I had taken every poem I had written about Kel, or to Kel, and slowly crafted them into two books, one for me, one for Kel. I'd gone to a printer, and they had stamped the red leather cover with the title. On the title page of this book I'd written, to the most caring man I've ever met, I love you. He wiped the tears from his eyes with the back of his hand. Suddenly, he stiffened, looked closely at each handwritten page, touched the letters, and drawings, and then he stared at me. He texted, You wrote this by hand? Not with a computer? I nodded and texted, There are only two copies. I want you to have one. You giving it to me? He texted. I don't know what was going on in his head, but he started crying for real. We sat, holding each other, not speaking or signing or texting. Just being with each other. His dad barged out the front door and yelled, Lewis, what the hell? What did you do to make my son cry? I will never approve of you. Get off my property, now. His mother came out to see what the fuzz was. She signed faster than I could follow, and Kel signed as well. He vocalized, I love Lewis. This is why I was crying. Dad, stop being mean all the time. Kel and his father stared at each other, but his mom took the book. She started reading it. She wiped the tears from her cheek and said, Lewis, you have my blessing to date my son. You can't be serious, his dad yelled. Then she thrust the book under his nose. Stop acting like a pregnant ox and read it before you break your son's heart and make him hate you forever, Bhakti ordered. These are love poems like the ones you used to write for me. I loved those poems. Why did you stop writing them? He thumbed through the pages, looking at the handwritten poems, at the red leather cover, at the note I'd written on the title page. Kel's dad's face reddened a little, and it looked like he was about to cry. Bhakti elbowed him in the ribs. Kel's father handed the book to Kel, saying and signing, Lewis, these are pretty good. I'm still not satisfied with your signing skills, but I apologize for my attitude. It looks like I need to write my own book of poems to get back in my wife's good graces. I have another surprise for Kel, I said. Kel, I know we have trouble communicating, but that won't be for long. Let's see if we can make us work. I then gave Kel my other present, the key to my apartment. I knew the ASL signs, and though my fingers were awkward, I said and signed, Kel, I love you. I want you to move in with me. His father almost fainted. Avi and the rest of the family had been listening at the door because Avi yelled, I call dibs on the top bunk. The next weekend, with the help of his family, Kel moved in with me. There was only the one bed, and I thought Kel's dad would have a heart attack when he saw it. A little while later, Bhakti held him as he cried, My boy has grown up. Before they left, Colin shook my hand and said, Welcome to the family. My brother texted me that night and asked, Can I move in with you? My wife found out about the debt and is thinking about divorcing me. Grandma has told all of us that she shall need her money because of a huge investment, and she can't support us anymore. She's selling off the antiques in the house. Can you give me just a few thousand, please? I replied, I don't have that kind of money, and now is a bad time to move in. My boyfriend just arrived, and we have to organize everything. You're on your own. You would choose your boyfriend over helping your family? It's an emergency, my brother texted. I responded with one word. Yep. Four weeks later was the last session of class. We had a small party and Grace gave out certificates of accomplishment for finishing the class. I received two surprises. The first I kind of hoped would happen. Kel had rearranged his schedule so he could be with me on graduation day. And Grace brought a friend to class, Grandma Ernesta. What are you doing here? I asked. I came to see my friend, Grace, Grandma signed and take care of some business. She smiled and stepped aside from my boyfriend. You can sign? I asked. I'm a little out of practice, 
but it was the best way to communicate with your grandfather, she said. But her eyes twinkled. I wanted to let you know that my next business venture is all your fault. Why? I asked. Remember when you gave me the little book? Its simple beauty reminded me of happier times. You're following your dreams, so why can't I? She said. I'm selling that old monster of a house, selling my company, and moving to an apartment with a view of the Eiffel Tower. I'm moving to Paris when all the paperwork is done. Then I'm traveling the world. Your grandpa and I always wanted to see the world, but we ran out of time. How did my family take you moving on? I asked. I told them to get off their butts and get a job. My new dream? I'm going to waste every cent I have left, she said. I'd like it if me, you, and Kel could spend a couple of weeks in Paris. My treat. But we'll talk about that later. Kel has something for you. Kel had brought a folder, and from it produced a hand-drawn comic book. He handed it to me, smiling, and he vocalized, read it. Now, I signed. He nodded. He had drawn the entire book, a story about a deaf man that looked just like Kel, falling in love with somebody at the mall who looked just like me. The final page had the man with long dark hair offering a gold ring to his love. He asked, will you marry me? The word balloon above the second man's head was blank. When I looked up, a gold ring suddenly appeared before me, and Kel handed me a pen. I took his pen and wrote in the word balloon, yes. The end. Thank you everybody for coming with me on this story. I'm Gio, and I appreciate you being a part of my channel. It's fun. We'll see you next Wednesday, and I hope you have a great week. Peace.